Hello and welcome to Christ Adonai. Today's message is entitled, Listen to Man or to God. My wife and I recently attended three mass rallies relating to the election and the election process. The first one was the return with Jonathan Kahn, held jointly with the Franklin Graham Prayer March in Washington, D.C. on September 26. The second one was the Bridge Builder and Cap Prayer Meeting at the Arizona State Legislature Lawn on November 1st. Both groups were held prior to the election. The third one was the Trump rally on November 14th after the election, again on the Arizona State Legislature lawn and surrounding parks. Interestingly, the Trump rally was also concurrently happening in Washington, D.C. and at most, if not all, state capital cities. All three events were impressive in their sizes, upwards of 200,000 for the first event, hundreds in the second event, and the third event combined in total were possibly in the millions. But numbers of attendees were not the most impressive impression on my mind and heart. True, these numbers of Americans gathering together in peaceful, focused attention have a significant impact. But let's take a closer look at what was happening. The first two events were dedicated prayer gatherings and marches. It was almost overwhelming to be a part of so many Christians focused on deep corporate prayers with the purpose of crying out to the Lord of Lords for America and the world from the perspective of what we believed was God's purpose and desire for the election outcome being beneficial to America. We were asking God to hold off on His judgment of the wickedness in America and give us more time to reconcile with God. We prayed against abortion and all evil practices that go against the Holy Scriptures. We thank God for, for sending us Donald Trump as president and for what he had accomplished, for how the president was bringing back Christian values and morality and had started moving the country back in the right direction. The focus on these two events was on Jesus Christ, asking him to protect and guide America. The third event grouping, the post-election rallies in each of the states, added, from my perspective, a sense of a new awareness of the deep state and its doings. There was genuine and enthusiastic support for Trump, the man, and deploring the evil intent of the numerous election violations from the opposition. What my wife and I experienced were small clusters of Christians praying to the Lord for his intervention in the dealings of humans against humans amidst the speeches to the crowd. And there were signs, many signs, such as, In God We Trust. A major focus was on the need for fair elections that, and that every legal ballot would be counted and every illegal or illegitimate ballot would be thrown out. That every lawbreaker would be brought to justice and that President Trump had our support. In the first two events we attended, there was a strong spiritual connection with our Lord and Savior. The last event had both a spiritual focus on the need for Christ to intervene and a physical focus on the need for change in politics and government in this country. On the news stations that carried the event, the common question asked by the reporters was why each of the people being interviewed had come to the event. The better question would have been, why had so many others not come to the event? This was our chance to be heard and to shine the light of Christ to others. But I wonder if, in general, we Christians are still missing the mark. Clearly, many of the church, the body of Christ, as a general statement, has been asleep for decades. Here are a few examples. 1963, prayer removed from public schools by the courts. 1973, abortion became legal. 2019, same-sex marriages became legal. Today, congressmen being exempt from treasonous allegations, lies, and perjury without penalty. State governors or mayors of large cities not allowing Christians to attend churches or reducing the numbers of attendees and forbidding singing in churches because of coronavirus concerns but allowing major retail stores and casinos to remain open to the public at large. 
totally biased major press organizations to include blatant lies, fear-mongering, and one-sided and slanderous commentators, and complete immunity from persecution in the name of freedom of the press. Where was the church's powerful voice in opposition to these and many more examples of ungodly activities? Why are numerous Christians voting for individuals who have stated positions in direct opposition to God's commands and institutions or not voting at all? Well, this apparent lack of spiritual consistency has been going on for many years and has only recently progressed to the point of becoming obvious to even the casual observer. Allow me to share with you a message Billy Graham gave in 1964. Consider carefully what he had to say about the times almost 60 years ago and the scriptures he quoted then and balance them with our current spiritual climate in America. And I quote Billy Graham's full sermon. I once asked a university professor what he thought our greatest need was. He considered it carefully before answering. He said, I could give you a variety of answers all the way from tax relief to disarmament. I may surprise you because I'm not a religious man, but I believe that the greatest need that we have at this hour is a spiritual awakening that will restore individual and collective morals and integrity throughout the nation. Continuing, to bear the name of Christian is not enough. If our conduct does not measure up to Christian standards, condemnation will be ours. You have a name that you are alive but you are dead, Revelations 3.1. To attend church is not enough either. If we fail to let Christ be Lord and master of our lives, we must come under the judgment of God who said, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, Matthew 15.8. A hostile world is seething with hatred, intrigue, lawlessness, and godless aggression. The wicked prosper, and in many areas of the world, the righteous suffer. People are confused, unstable, and unhappy. Scarcely, if ever, has economic prosperity been accompanied by such widespread unhappiness, lawlessness, and rebellion. The heart of the world is aching for peace, for reality, and for God. The prophet Habakkuk once stood in the midst of a people who had been showered with every conceivable blessing, but who had lost their spiritual sanity. And he cried, O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. Habakkuk 3.2. That is the heart cry of thousands of people everywhere. It is our greatest need. Spiritual revival has been important in the life of the United States. God has not blessed us simply because a few pilgrims prayed at Plymouth Rock. We have been favored because periodically as a nation, we have returned to God in repentance and corrected our manner of life before the hand of judgment fell. Too little is said in secular history about the part that spiritual revival has played in the United States. Soon after the colonists arrived, people's minds returned to gold rather than God. The country bogged down with greed, the churches were poorly attended, and the tide of atheism rushed in to fill up the vacuum left by the absence of religion. But a group of people in New England began to pray for revival. In 1734, in Northampton, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards preached his famous sermon on the judgment of God, and in a single service, hundreds repented of their sins and sought God. People everywhere returned to Christian decency and righteous living. In a short time, nearly one-sixth of the nation's population was won to Christ. The churches were filled with devout worshipers, and revival made its impact on the social life of early America. Liquor manufacturing began in the United States. Saloons sprang up everywhere. The nation went on a colossal binge. Home life degenerated. Morals plunged. Gambling was widespread. Infidelity thrived and corruption was prevalent in high places. But in Richmond, Virginia, prayer meetings broke out. God's people became concerned about the evil forces that were thriving to the utter peril of the nation's spiritual life. Revival fires began to burn across the land. Sobriety was restored. 
Homes were rebuilt, infidelity lost its grip, and thousands of lives were transformed by the power of Christ. American-based foreign missions had their birth in this awakening, and the nation was saved from a fate worse than death. In answer to the cry of his people, God revived his work in the midst of the years. Woodrow Wilson once said, America was born a Christian nation for the purpose of exemplifying to the nations of the world the principles of righteousness found in the Word of God. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said, The destiny of America is to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to all men everywhere. And Franklin Roosevelt once said, I doubt if there is any problem, social, moral, or political, that could not melt away before the fire of spiritual awakening. These are prominent leaders who have had the faculty of weighing and evaluating our needs. They put God and spiritual revival at the center where they belong. If we ever needed guidance, if we ever needed stability, if we ever needed strength, if we ever needed faith, if we ever needed integrity, if we ever needed righteousness, if we ever needed a heaven-sent revival, it is at the present hour. But how, you may ask, do we achieve renewal and revival? What are the steps to a spiritual awakening? First, there must be earnest prayer. The Bible says, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 2 Chronicles 7.14 There must be a deep-seated heart yearning for revival, not just a mere muttering of words, pious platitudes, and religious mornings, but honest, fervent prayer. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. James 5, 16. Let your soul be anguished. Let the tears flow. Let your heart be burdened by the lost. Tears are appropriate. For God's word says, He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalm 126, 6. Second, we must forsake our sins. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and their unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, Isaiah 55, 7. Again, the Bible says, if my people turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. The bickering, the prejudices, the ill will, the envy, the jealousy, the bitterness and the criticism amongst Christian people today must end before revival can begin. The revival must begin in the hearts of Christians before evangelism can be brought effectively to the world. When Christ's disciples settled their differences, gave up their selfishness, confessed their sins, and allowed God's Spirit to fill them, revival came. We must forsake our evil ways. God's Spirit cannot operate in a climate of dissension and quarrels. We must forsake our pettiness, our peevishness, our littleness, and our whims. The enemy of souls has weakened the effectiveness of the church because we have majored on controversy and dissension rather than on going forth weeping and bearing precious seed. May God forgive us and help us to forsake our wicked, contemptuous ways. Third, God must be real to us. The Bible says, if my people seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. In a world filled with crass materialism, we have tried to whittle God down to our size. We have created a God in our minds who is not the revealed God of the Bible. Many say it is all right to go to church and a person ought to be decent, but I don't believe in going overboard on religion. They think the Christian faith is a phobia bordering on mental incompetence. If Christianity is important to all, it is all important. If it is anything at all, it is everything. It is either the most vital thing in your life or it isn't worth bothering with. You can know God. Millions of Christians are saying with assurance, I know I've passed from death to life, 1 John 3, 14. I know whom I believe, 2 Timothy 1, 12. We need a revival of Christian faith. 
of Christian experience, of God consciousness. God has said, if my people seek my face, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If we would rediscover that he is holy, righteous, real, absolute, and personal, and that he is a God of love and mercy, then this reality would be transferred to the world and revival can come. Don't give lie to the Christian faith by professing Christ without possessing him. Don't lock the church door with the key of inconsistency and keep the lost from coming to Christ. Don't hinder a revival by your unbelief and prayerlessness. Don't cheat yourself out of spiritual victory by allowing sin to imprison you. Seek God's face and turn from your wicked ways. Then he will hear from heaven. The church holds the key to revival. It is within our grasp. Will we rise to the challenge? Will we dare pay the price? The supply of heaven is adequate for the spiritually starved world. Will we fail to offer that supply? Have you accepted Christ as your savior? If not, you will admit that deep down inside you is an emptiness that needs to be filled. Your heart yearns for peace and joy and forgiveness. There is a void that the world cannot satisfy. In the center of history on a low hill in Palestine, a cross was erected, the cross of Christ, the Son of God. By some wonderful miracle known only to God, all who look to the Lamb slain on the cross have life. Not just the good, respectable and decent, but the vile, the despicable, and the outcast. A thief dying with Jesus looked believingly upon him and was assured of life everlasting. The Bible says that Jesus made peace through the blood of his cross and that by Christ God reconciled all things to himself. Give your life to Christ today and may the revival that the world needs begin in you. Well, that is what Billy Graham preached in 1964, and it is just as valid to America today. I am particularly chagrined by Billy Graham's depiction of the division within the church, the body of Christ. We are more separated by the few differences in denominational doctrine than united by the overwhelming agreement to God's word. The Holy Spirit is the authorized interpreter of the word of God, not us. So let him do it. We hear of pastors preaching the need for Christians to show more love and compassion for people, but not about the love of God for his people, a more worldly view of man instead of a more spiritual view of God. Revival comes from the ripping apart the worldview from the hearts of man and the rebuilding the spiritual view of Almighty God into the hearts of man. We have to let loose our pampered adoration for calmness, peace, and harmony, our let's all get along view. And we must adopt Jesus' command for obedience to God regardless of personal cost. He restores my soul. He leads me on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I will never forget what the pastor who led me through the ordination process and ordained me once said. Don't listen to what pastors say. Listen to the word of God in scriptures that the pastors preach. We pastors need to preach the cause of God. And you and I must maintain our focus on Christ and Christ alone. God never gives us his opinion. He gives us his divine principles and commandments. He is God. He is the final say. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm also preaching to myself when I say, ask yourself this, what did Jesus mean when he said to each of us as Christians, go therefore and make disciples of all nations? What is the totality of this command to you? Have you done it? If not, why not? I mean, is this a command from God? Does it apply to you? Does it bother if you have ever ignored God's command to you personally? Are you complaining about the country's condition? A condition has been deteriorating from God's perspective for many years, but you have done little or nothing to correct it? We seem eager to tell God what he has to do in this election process, but we have fallen so critically short in doing what God has told us to do in our own lives and in our country. 
John 5, 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. There is no greater thrill for me than to see the eyes of men, women, or youths who have just accepted the gift of eternal life from our Lord and Savior. The harvest is plentiful if the workers are working. Is it timely that we maybe revisit our view of retirement? Is it going from doing something to doing nothing because we no longer get paid for it? Is it now our time to do what we want to do, to spend our money however way it most gives us pleasure, to visit the family or friends we have known over our lifetime, but not to do what God has commanded us to do? Oh God, forgive me. Forgive me my failings and my shortcomings. Help me to be who you died for. Help me to be obedient to your word in all that I do. I renew my covenant with you to be your child, an obedient child, a child who reflects the light of your love for me to the rest of the world. Help me, dear Jesus, to maintain my focus on Christ and Christ alone. Let it be said of me, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So, Lord, here am I. Send me. I have died of self that you could live in me. Let's recite this song in our hearts, thinking deeply about the words the author penned. The title is All to Jesus I Surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me, Savior, holy thine. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. All to Jesus I surrender. Now I feel the sacred flame. Oh, the joy of full salvation. Glory, glory to his name. Now are we ready to be onward Christian soldiers, marching as to war with the crosses Jesus going on before? God says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Billy Graham summarized by saying the steps to spiritual awakening are, there must be earnest prayer. We must forsake our sins. God must be real to us. I pray it is so. Revival in America and the world must begin with me and with you. What will be your first step in this process? What are you willing to commit to God to do? Write it out and send it to me and to someone else who can hold you accountable for doing it. Are we ready? Then let's go get them. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye for now.